Hello, everybody. Welcome here today. This is a debate on marijuana policy. It was organized by Lubbock Liberty. I'm Amanda Smith, co-founder of Lubbock Liberty and local political activist as well. Lubbock Liberty is a collaborative, it's a collaboration of advocates around the Lubbock, Texas area that are dedicated to protecting individual rights and liberties and facilitating discussions like these. I want to start out by thanking the Mahon Library for the facility use. We use it often for our workshops and our other candidate forums and they've been very accommodating to us. As you can see, we're recording this debate back here on marijuana policy, so we ask that you please silence your cell phones at this time and be considerate of the library rules. If you haven't been to one of our events, I urge you to check out lubbockliberty.com to view our video archives and more. We've been hosting the speaker workshops and candidate forums on various topics since April 2013. So we're glad to have you here today in this April 2015. The attention on, sub on the subject of marijuana is too evident to ignore. Many liberty activists are questioning the effectiveness of current illicit drug policy. Whether you believe the policy on marijuana should be reformed or you're satisfied with the system and maybe you wish to strengthen it perhaps, or maybe you're just somewhere in between. Lubbock Liberty is interested in facilitating the discussion that addresses all issues that affect our personal liberty. I'd like to first start out by introducing our debate participants today, beginning with our speakers in alphabetical order. We have Dr. Donald R. May. He's a retina surgeon with expertise in severe ocular trauma. Following his surgical training at the University of Illinois College of Med Medicine in Chicago, he founded the United States Air Force Retina and Ocular Trauma Service, for which he received the Air Force Commendation Medal. He's been on the medical faculties of Northwestern University, the University of Illinois, the University of Texas San Antonio, the University of California Davis, the University of California San Francisco, Tulane University, and Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center. He served as a staff and faculty surgeon at eight Veterans Administration Medical Centers, Prior to moving to Lubbock in 1989 as chairman of ophthalmology, Dr. May was professor of ophthalmology at Tulane University and director of the Tulane Ophthalmology Service at the Charity Hospital New Orleans. Dr. May served as an associate dean and taught MBA students as a professor of health organization management at the Texas Tech University School of Medicine. Dr. May was the founder of the Texas Eye Injury Registry and a co-founder of the United States Eye Injury Registry, where he served as president. He has authored more than 100 peer-reviewed scientific publications, including an epidemiological study of 8,952 patients with severe eye injuries, the largest trauma epidemiological study ever reported. Dr. May writes a daily column for his Mr. Conservative blog. His debates with Professor Arnold Lowy of the Texas Tech School of Law appear every other Sunday on the op-ed page of the Lubbock Avalanche Journal. On Sunday, April 6, 2014, their debate, Should Marijuana Be Legalized, appeared in the Avalanche Journal and online. Jake Simme is the communications director for Hub City Normal, which is the local Lubbock and South Plains chapter of Normal, which is the national organization of the reform of marijuana laws. Jake is a 1997 graduate of Taft High School in Taft, Texas, where he was active in both athletic and academic pursuits, including student council and membership for the National Honor Society. Taft, named for president and later SCOTUS Chief Justice William Howard Taft, is known as the friendliest cotton picking town in Texas. <laughs> He's an academic research librarian by day and an activist on most nights and weekends. He has been active in firearms-related activism for more than 17 years and marijuana law reform for a little more than three years. He actually came to marijuana rights activism from firearms rights activism once he realized how alike the two were. And on our question panel, we have Ron Wheeler, sitting over here, and Mallory Miller. They're longtime liberty activists and local political leaders as well and friends of mine. 
We'll begin with five minute opening statements from our speakers, then our panel will ask the speakers a list of questions which were submitted by the public prior to the event. For every question, the speakers will have up to three minutes each for initial response and one minute each for follow up and rebuttal. Our timekeeper, Aaron, will alert the speakers as their time runs out. We'll take a break before noon and reconvene for more questions, concluding statements, and then the closing. Thank you very much for joining us. And we'll begin with our first speaker, which we drew for, Dr. Donald May. He will start out with the opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Donald. Is this the podium we're going to be using here? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Um, I can move that. Let's just put this right down here on my chair. And we're going to be all set. We don't want that to Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. It's very, uh, uh, very good to be here. Uh, I have a lot of experience with marijuana, not the use, but I grew up on a farm that was uh, in the midst of the largest hemp growing area in the United States of America. And we had ditch weed all over the place. And people on weekends would come down with their gunny sacks from Chicago and pick uh, loads and loads of ditch weed to take back to Chicago and smoke and sell. I also had extensive experience as a trauma surgeon because uh, marijuana usage and other drugs were very, very prominent in the, uh, many of the patients that we saw over the years. I oppose the legalization of marijuana because it, in my experience as a surgeon and in person is a dangerous drug leading to major mental, physical, and social problems in our society. No one has ever associated pot smoking with academic achievement, high intelligence, or personal success. Marijuana smokers, smokers characteristically have lower test scores in our schools, poor grades, and it may be why some of our political leaders seal their school and university records. It's something to think about. Uh, maybe this is why so, many of our, what, so much of our political leadership in our government is so confused. Pot smokers are often disheveled. If they rise to high positions, such as Barack Obama, they often think slowly, they have trouble making decisions, and they take a long time to make their decisions. Uh, often everything they seem to touch falls apart and does not work out well. Big gulps of soda are banned in New York. But pot smoking is encouraged in Colorado and California. Cigarette smokers are demonized, but marijuana smokers are cheered on. People don't seem to worry about secondhand marijuana smoke. In fact, some people gravitate toward it. French fries are ridiculed, while marijuana lace brownies and chocolates are promoted. Study two years ago, coming out in January 2014, Northwestern University School of Medicine, where I did my medical internship, study came out two years ago and showed that heavy marijuana usage by students, teenage students, uh, caused structural abnormalities in the brain, thought process problems, and memory problems when these individuals were in their early 20s less than 10 years after the onset of heavy marijuana usage. Marijuana usage has been shown to significantly impair certain brain functions, such as the ability to handle even normal mathematical calculations. Something to consider when we look at the fact that the United States is ranked about number 35 out of the top 65 nations in the world for mathematical abilities of our high school and college students. Pot smoking is only for the purpose of getting high. There are claimed medical benefits to smoking marijuana, including decreasing nausea and increasing the appetites for AIDS patients. This became particularly popular in the San Francisco area. Uh, I was a surgeon there starting in 79. I, was, uh, I saw some of the very first uh, AIDS patients that, uh, that presented in the, uh, in the world and uh, uh, between 79 and, uh, and 84 and uh, noted that many of these people had appetite problems and supposedly marijuana helps. Now there's a commercial drug out there, Marinol. This is not uh, the drug of choice for people who have nausea and problems. They like the marijuana because it gives a quick hit. It hits within a few seconds rather than the Marinol drug. Uh, studies have shown that marijuana can lead to severe mental disorders such as psychoses, schizophrenic-like diseases, and narcissism. And we do not know if uh, Obama's younger age of uh, sniffing ganja from the roof of the car has anything to do with his current uh, problem with uh, narcissism, but something, again, to consider. 
Uh, to alcohol is brought up. It's fiction that alcohol consumption and marijuana usage are anywhere similar. There's absolutely no relation with the two, historically or physiologically. Uh, moderate alcohol consumption can reduce heart disease, can greatly benefit health. Canadian studies coming out more than three decades ago showed that men having one or two drinks a day lived as long as 10 or 15 years longer than men who didn't drink or men who had more than three drinks a day. We're all very familiar with the devastating effects and consequences of excessive alcohol consumption. Driving, other activities while, incarcerate, uh, while intoxicated, going out in boats, jet skiing, and so forth, results in thousands of deaths per year and hundreds of thousands of injuries per year. Uh, marijuana is adding to the total. Fatal crashes involving marijuana have tripled in the United States in the past decade. One in nine drivers now in the United States in fatal crashes test positive for marijuana. There are major health risks with marijuana. Lung damage takes place up to five times as fast with marijuana as with cigarettes. It's estimated in one study that uh, four marijuana joints will, uh, are equivalent to one pack of Marlboros. Dependency withdrawal symptoms are seen now in more than 30% of all marijuana users. Uh, drug treatment centers, drug abuse hotlines are reporting marked increases in marijuana addiction as a major problem. I don't have any specific data on that yet. It's still early on. Holland legalized marijuana and they changed their mind very, very quickly. It didn't work out well. The Dutch have again started to make marijuana illegal. The pot dispensaries in Amsterdam, specifically called coffee houses, are shutting down. The tourist trade to come to, to Amsterdam to get marijuana has again shut down. Amsterdam quickly became the most violent city in Europe with marked increase in drug-related crimes. Criminal groups quickly started taking over the legal sale of marijuana. Marijuana among the Dutch children greatly increased and the rates of truancy and academic achievement plummeted. Now I favor, I'm a conservative, I favor a small federal government that protects us and otherwise keeps out of our business and our lives and allows us to do everything we want to as long as it does not harm other people. I want our federal government to protect us from our enemies and to keep our nation secure. And that must include protecting us from bad medications, bad drugs, drug crimes, drugs, and marijuana. I believe that is the role of our federal government and only our federal government can handle it that complex situation. There are three general questions. Can the production, sale, and use of marijuana be legalized in the individual states? Is marijuana usage a benefit to the individual or to society, or does marijuana usage conflict with the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness of the American people? There are four constitutional questions that arise in this debate. Does a state law have the right to violate existing federal laws which prohibit marijuana usage? Number two, can the Obama administration refuse to enforce federal drug laws in states that legalize marijuana? Number three, is it permissible for state law knowingly to add to the financial burdens of our federal government? And number four, does an individual have the right to become a burden on others and on society? Current state laws that legalize marijuana are in open conflict with the Controlled Substances Act of 1970. Congress cho has chosen repeatedly not to remove marijuana as a Schedule I drug because of the preponderance of scientific evidence that shows marijuana to be a dangerous, addictive drug, totally unlike alcoholic beverages. This is true both in Republican and in democratically controlled Congresses. Legalized sale of marijuana, including medical marijuana, bypasses approved processes for the FDA. The lack of FDA oversight means that marijuana products can be adulterated and can have any compounds in. I'm gonna just keep going. I'm gonna be very short in my closing statement. While we should be free to do as we please, as long as we don't harm others, government oversight is necessary when the activities endanger lives of others and violate the liberty and pursuit of happiness of the American people. Marijuana and other drugs, including excess use of alcoholic beverages, impair one's judgment and can make one a danger to others. 
Does one have the freedom to reject personal responsibility, to increase one's chances of failure, and to become a non-productive and a, become non-productive and a burden on the goodwill and tax payments of others? Life, liberty, and happiness were directly related <coughs> to work and productivity in the minds of fund founding fathers. Our state should not be experimenting with drug legalization. The risks are too great. When things go unexpectedly badly, it's difficult to get the, the genie back in the bottle. And I thank you for your time, and I appreciate you letting me go over it. Thank you. Very friendly. I try to be. <laughs> Jake Simi. I'm the communications director for Hub City Normal, as Amanda mentioned earlier. And also, uh, she mentioned that I came to uh, cannabis law reform movement from uh, firearms rights activism, uh, once I found out how similar the two were. Uh, my epiphany on this issue came back in 2011, during the uh, 2011 legislative session. Um, there were some debates on campus about uh, campus carry, uh, a sort of sub-issue or sub-movement within the CHL movement. And um, I read an article by you know, um, astronomer, author, and science blogger Phil Plate, and he said, as usual, debunking something takes more time and effort than it does to simply say wrong things. Um, I made some notes um, from Dr. May's opening statements. I hope I will have time and effort to get around to them, uh, but for now, let me just go through my intro slideshow. Uh, former state representative Susanna Hupp, uh, survivor of the Luby's massacre. Oh, actually, we're not getting these. It needs to be refreshed properly. Um, how, do I just? Power button. Power button? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You have to return on your computer, too. Yeah, Sorry about that. Lights. Yeah. Should be able to see it. Okay. Oh. Once it comes up. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Phil Plate was talking about basically a science alarmism. Um, the article was no, a pole shift won't cause global superstorms. That was something people were worried about at the time. A pole shift in the Earth's magnetic poles. Uh, also, similarly, at around the same time, the LHC, or Large Hadron Collider, at CERN uh, in Switzerland, uh, you know, people were worried, you know, oh my goodness, uh, they're going to accidentally cause a black hole that will, you know, destroy the Earth. Uh, so he was writing a lot of these types of debunking articles at that time, and, you know, I read that and I thought, at that time, I guess it was 13 or 15 <coughs> years worth of firearms rights activism, it's like, that is what I do day in and day out. Um, Susanna Gratia Hupp, survivor of the Luby's Massacre, how a politician stands on the Second Amendment tells you how he or she views you as an individual, as a trustworthy and productive citizen, or as part of an unruly crowd that needs to be lorded over, controlled, supervised, and taken care of. I would posit that this also applies to the cannabis law reform movement. Uh, words matter. Um, Dr. May, I believe, knows my uh, friend, Kenny Kettner, chair of the Lubbock County Democratic Party. That's uh, one of the people I was alluding to earlier when I told Dr. May that I disagree strongly with many of my friends on many issues. Um, <laughs> words mean things, and that is something that I learned especially, was especially important in the firearm rights reform movement. Uh, people throw the term machine gun around. Uh, as if they have any idea of what it means. It actually has a legal meaning from the NFA or National Firearms Act in 1934. Um, the word assault rifle, you see that a lot in the press uh, when there's any kind of crime. That's a technical term. Most people have no idea what that means. 
Uh, and then assault weapon, which you might hear, I usually say so-called assault weapon, uh, that's a political term. Uh, it basically, um, Josh uh, Sugarman, the chair of the Anti-Gun Violence Policy Center, uh, said that basically the public's confusion over you know, assault weapons, and assault rifles, anything that looks like a machine gun can be assumed to be a machine gun, can only increase the chance of basically people voting to ban them. Uh, I would also posit that that applies a great deal in the topic of our debate today. Uh, so words still matter. Cannabis has a, uh, is a scientific word. It's a genus, we'll get into that in a bit. Hemp uh, is a kind of an old world term. Uh, it has a very general meaning now. Industrial hemp uh, is a technical uh, definition since at least the 70s, and it's acquiring a legal definition. Marijuana with a J, it uh, was historically a political term. It's becoming a technical term. Uh, racist roots in the United States, which we'll get into. And marijuana with an H, uh, same thing. Cannabis, a genus of flowering plants. Uh, three different species, sativa, indica, and ruderalis. And there are innumerable strains within and between species. Uh, there can often be more variants within a single species of cannabis, like indica, for example, than there is even between species. Uh, hemp and industrial hemp, term used for high growing, which becomes important, varieties of the cannabis plant and its products, uh, which includes a lot of uh, products that are industrial in nature, uh, and can be refined into others. Uh, basically, uh, high growing, if you think of it like bamboo, you want it real close together and it grows toward the sky. And uh, marijuana, psychoactive stuff, uh, generally low growing uh, plants, three to six feet, uh, although six is kind of the upper range of that. Uh, marijuana, the technical term, uh, dried leaves, basically plant matter uh, from usually cannabis sativa, uh, which importantly contains a psychoactive chemical, Delta 9 THC. Uh, that's from NIDA, the National Institutes on Drug Abuse. Uh, no friends to our issue. Uh, general breakdown, 0.35%. At or below that is industrial hemp. That or higher is marijuana. Basically, if it's psychoactive, if it's, mar it's marijuana. If it's non-psychoactive, it's industrial hemp. Uh, marijuana with an H, per the OED. Uh, that term began to be preferred in the 1930s in the debate over drug policy uh, as a more exotic alternative to the familiar words hemp and cannabis. By exotic, I was referring to those racist roots earlier. Basically, if it sounds more Mexican, it's easier for us to ban. Uh, there were already existing words, hemp and cannabis. People knew what those were talking about. Uh, I'll draw a parallel to the difference between, uh, there is none, between suppressors uh, in firearms uh, law, and silencers, which was basically a marketing term that sounded scary and became embodied in law. Uh, they don't silence the report, they suppress it. Silencer sounds scarier. Uh, which brings me to 1994, True Lies. Uh, they call them the sand spike. Sorry, it was louder earlier. Um, <laughs> Bring this back up. Hopefully, you can hear that. I got some great. Okay. I call it sand spike. Why? Probably because it sounds scary. Uh, Charlton Heston, as the head of Omega Group, asking why they call a particular terrorist a sand spider. Probably because it sounds scary. Uh, so, since 1971, illegal drugs are now cheaper, stronger, and more available than ever. That's from the DEA and the British Medical Journal. Uh, the war on drugs, the epitome of a failed government program. Take it off of life support. Don't perpetuate it. And uh, from economics, we have the iron law of prohibition. The harder the enforcement, the harder the drugs. It's an example of the Alchian Allen effect. And uh, I think we can end. I'll end on that note, actually. Uh, Ronald Reagan from uh, Time for Choosing, no government ever voluntarily reduces itself in size. Government programs once launched never disappear. Actually, a government bureau is the nearest thing to eternal life we'll ever see on this earth. And uh, basically, the history of firearms prohibition, of alcohol prohibition, and marijuana prohibition are both shining examples of that.
Thank you very much for your opening statements. And we'll move forward to the question and answer session. If you could both take your seats there. Certainly. And if you'd both like to uh, stand up and stretch your legs every now and then, you can do that as well during the questions. Okay, we're also going to start with uh, Dr. Donald May for the questioning. So he's going to start by answering the first question first, and then uh, Jake will follow. And that was done also by drawing straws. It's by chance. Do you want us to move that back and forth? Oh, that's fine right there. Is that okay? Okay. Okay. When you all can begin. All right, well, first off, I want to. Thank you both again for being willing to, to participate in this debate, so thank you very much. Uh, first question, what is the history and purpose of marijuana prohibition? The uh, history and purpose, the, the purpose of marijuana pro uh, a prohibition and other drugs throughout history is that they have been recognized for thousands of years to cause more permanent problems. Uh, and society has looked at this and said that people who use these drugs uh, get themselves in trouble, get society in trouble, and uh, problems arise from it. So this is the history of the prevention of the drug, saying this is a detriment to the individual, the individual becomes non-productive, becomes a less useful person in society, and causes problems in society that should not be tolerated. Okay, and... All right. Um, just jumping off of that last point, uh, before I get into mine, um, less useful member of society, I believe. Uh, I don't know how much less useful a member of society uh, than a prisoner can be. Um, my position is that is the wrong public policy choice for, um, for marijuana consumption. Uh, but speaking of a little history, uh, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, the FBN, was started by Harry Anslinger, the first commissioner, in 1930. Uh, he basically authored the Marijuana Tax Act and handed it to a friendly uh, representative from North Carolina. Uh, later became the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. Um, in 1971, they had 1,500 agents at a 1971 budget level of $43 million. Uh, now we have the Drug Enforcement Agency from 1973 to present, 2009 count, 10,784 employees, of which 5,000 of those are actual agents. Uh, $3 billion budget in 2012 dollars, speaking of growth of government. Um, I have some relevant alcohol laws, 18th Amendment, National Prohibition Act, and then the Increased Penalties Act of 1929, the Jones Act, because people weren't listening to the government. You know, they weren't uh, doing what government was trying to force them to do. So, hey, I know, let's increase the penalties even more. Uh, that was basically the death knell. Um, in 1933, we had the 21st Amendment repealing prohibition. Um, marijuana laws, again, the uh, Marijuana Tax Act of 1937, the Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs, the UN Treaty in 1961. Uh, nine years later, Congress finally passed the Controlled Substances Act of 1970 that Dr. May appears so enamored of in order to implement said UN Treaty. Um, marijuana was placed in Schedule I as a provisional measure, uh, but it, you know, uh, moving at the speed of government, it has sort of stagnated there. Um, and I yield back the remainder of my time, if any. All right. Dr. May, do you have a follow-up? I have a follow-up. How much, how much time are we allowed in the follow-up? One minute. One minute. For a uh, it was brought up that marijuana is, uh, is often used for incarceration. If we look at the individual cases of people in jail who are in, uh, in jail for marijuana use, virtually every one of these is on, in there on a drug usage charge because they've pled down their charges from firearm use, armed robbery, assault, battery, and so forth and they've pled down to get the minimum sentence for this person. Many of them are first time or second time offenders. Uh, alcohol in history has been shown to be a very positive used in moderation in, in all cultures. All cultures use it and they, there has always been a distinction between the use, the rational use of alcohol and the use of drugs. Thank you very much and 
That's yeah, yeah, each of you one second. Are you are you good? Yeah, I don't think I get a rebuttal to his. No, rebuttal. did you each, each speak twice? I spoke. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I spoke once. He's. I mean, I spoke twice. He only spoke once. Okay, so, so do you, would you like to follow? Do I follow? Okay, okay, absolutely. Um, so uh, I just want to make a quick point. Dr. May's opening statement. Uh, he mentioned uh, big gulps and marijuana. Um, you know, New York basically prohibiting one and, and possibly allowing the other. Um, I don't know that it's occurred to anyone that it might not be the uh, job of the government to prohibit either of those. I uh, just wanted to throw that out there for consideration. All right, we can move forward with the next question. Yes. The next question is, what should be the state or federal government position on scientific research on marijuana? Go and now you would actually be answering the opening. first, Jake. Yes. Okay. Um, so right now, uh, I mentioned NIDA earlier, the National Institutes of Drug Abuse. Uh, they basically control the keys to the kingdom for uh, research uh, on marijuana. Um, I heard Dr. May in the beginning, uh, before this had ever begun, mentioning a ditch weed, or maybe, maybe even an opening statement, uh, mentioning ditch weed on uh, his family farm. Uh, that would be a charitable uh, description of the NIDA crop that, you know, it, it takes almost an act of Congress to get uh, an FDA approved uh, trial using uh, NIDA um, product, I guess. Uh, you know, people have looked at those for years, you know, uh, taking pictures and it is not good looking stuff. It is a low quality crop. Um, and actually, what was the can you repeat the question? Yes. What should be the state oh. or federal government yes. position on scientific research on marijuana? Um, that it should uh, not have such a high barrier to entry, essentially. And I yield the remainder of my time. Dr. Well, scientific research is important both at the federal and the state level. And one of the reasons with marijuana is that it is a, a, a plant that is loaded with chemical compounds, some of which may be very useful. Just because a drug has harmful effects or a product has harmful effects does not mean that there's not useful things in there. Uh, there has been uh, assertions that uh, it will reduce pressure inside the eye help glaucoma. And we found out in studies that someone has to be pretty much high 24-7 in order to have any appreciable effects on, on uh, glaucoma. But again, the fact that this may have some effect is, is useful. Uh, as we've seen with AIDS patients, uh, it can help appetite, it can help pain. Uh, there's many, many assertions, and these need to be looked at from the, the, from the drug perspective. Also, it's very important to look at it as an addictive drug and to continue to study it as we do other drugs, cocaine, and, and, uh, and so forth. So the government does have a role in promoting research in these areas, as does private industry. Uh, there are private industries, drug companies and such, that are looking at the psychoactive and other components of marijuana and other drugs. Jake, do you have follow-up? Um, yes. Uh, first of all, from your introduction of Dr. May, uh, which I thought was excellent, uh, you mentioned a certain study of his that had an N, or a sample size, of 8,952, which is admirable. I love studies like that. Um, then just now he mentioned a, a glaucoma study. Um, I would also be interested in the sample size of that. But before that, um, just a, that's a kind of piddling issue, uh, but a lot of the ones we see have small sample sizes. But um, an actual pharmacological profile, uh, you know, uh, there are plenty of studies I've looked at where, um, you know, you don't they don't really know what the people are getting. They just say marijuana. When uh, GlaxoSmithKline or Merck, you know, trials a, n a new wonder drug, they don't you know, ask a bunch of high school students to see what they can score in the restroom of their high school and, you know, study the effects on that. These things are controlled. They know uh, there's quality control, product control. They know exactly what they're getting. Dr. May? A uh, follow-up there on uh, what uh, Jake just said is, as far as the drugs go, if you buy a commercial marijuana drug, Marinol, it has only one component, the tetrahydrocannabinol. Uh, and, and uh, uh, in the plants themselves, there's 50, 60 different types of cannabinols in there. And again, we don't know the effects of these other ones. This is the psychoactive portion, the major psychoactive portion. We don't know what the other chemicals do. 
And, and again, virtually all of our medications come from plant sources. They're, they're synthetic, they're modified, and so forth, but, but any a medication I am certainly in favor of, of looking at because we never know when we're gonna find something that is useful. But be that as it may, I don't approve of the use, of the open use of it as a psychoactive recreational drug. All right, and we can go ahead and go on with our next question. All right, yes. Yeah. So marijuana is presently scheduled as a, or as a Schedule One drug under federal law. This means that it meets two criteria. One, it has a high potential for abuse, and two, no medically accepted value. Uh, with the federal government holding a patent in nearly half of all the states with, uh, with doctors recommending for various treatments, is it appropriate to keep marijuana classified as a Schedule One drug federally? I didn't understand your question about a patent. He's talking about that the, the government has a patent on marijuana. You want to just go ahead and just repeat the question the one more time? The federal government has patented marijuana? The NIH, I think, is, yeah. the, is the actual, is the federal it government holding the patent. NIH. Yeah, this, the, the, uh, the classification as a Schedule I drug is to protect the people. The Schedule I basically means it has psychoactive capabilities such as heroin, cocaine, and so forth. Um, I'm a licensed physician. I have federal narcotic license and a state narcotics license, and it's very stringent as to what, how we can, we have to, to deal with these particular drugs. As I've said since 1970, uh, Congress has repeatedly looked at this, and this includes totally uh, controlled by, Congress is con totally controlled by the Republicans, as under George W. Bush. Congress is controlled totally by the Democrats, as, as under Barack Obama and they have all, each of the committees each time has come to the conclusion that this is a psychoactive drug, drug should be not taken out of Schedule One, and uh, currently has no, no useful medical uses as far as we can see. In spite of that, they've approved the use of a drug called Marinol, which contains the, the, uh, the major component, an active component of, of, of marijuana. Psychoactive, yes. Um, so again, you know, we see the Controlled Substances Act or CSA of 1970. Like I mentioned earlier, it was to uh, uh, implement the 1961 UN Convention, the Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs. Uh, I mentioned earlier that marijuana was placed in Schedule One provisionally. Uh, in 1970, the U.S. Congress enacted the CSA to implement the UN Treaty, placing marijuana into Schedule One on the advice of Assistant Secretary of Health Roger Egberg. His letter to Harley Staggers, chairman of the House Committee on Interstate and Foreign Commerce, indicates the classification was intended to be provisional. And I quote, some question has been raised about whether the use of the plant itself produces severe psychological or physical dependence as required by a Schedule I or even Schedule II criterion. Since there is still a considerable void in our knowledge of the plant and effects of the active drug contained in it, our recommendation is that marijuana be retained within Schedule I at least until the completion of certain studies now underway to resolve the issue. The certain studies he was alluding to, uh, the CSA of 1970, uh, also created the National Commission on Marijuana and Drug Abuse, informally known as the Schaefer Commission, chaired by Governor Schaefer of Pennsylvania. Um, again, that was 1970. In 1971, President Nixon attempted to influence Schaefer. And I quote, uh, you're enough of a pro to know that for you to come out with something that would run counter to what the Congress feels and what the country feels and what we're planning to do would make your commission just look bad as hell. Uh, May 26, 1971, the next month Nixon declared the war on drugs and that drug use is public enemy number one. Finally, in 1972, the Schaefer Commission issued its report recommending an end to marijuana prohibition. Uh, specifically decriminalization, not legalization. Uh, he was for incremental steps. Uh, that report was basically file 13 because the political uh, capital had already been spent and it would look bad as hell for Nixon to have gone back on the declaration of the war on drugs. Right. Dr. May, do you have a follow-up? I'm going to pass on the follow-up. Okay, and uh, Jake, would you like to add anything? I'm good. Yield Thank your you. time. Okay. And we can move on to the next question. The next question uh, deals with um, uh, mental illness medications. Uh, the FDA has approved medication for our mental illness epidemic. 
bipolar, Alzheimer's, dementia, schizophrenia, and many other conditions. Um, those medications can be very dangerous if misused. In states which allow medical marijuana use, some doctors prescribe the natural form for mental illnesses. Do you think prescribing marijuana for mental illnesses is more or less dangerous than other commonly prescribed drugs? I think Jay goes first on this question. Um, I would like to ask Dr. May what the LD50, the lethal dose uh, on both of, or any of all of those are. Um, you know, global cannabis related marijuana deaths, um, you know, unless a, a bale falls on you. Um, or uh, I don't know how many of you used to watch The Office, the American version of that. Uh, you know, Dwight Schrute, uh, you know, was a sheriff's deputy on the weekends, and he said, you know, uh, cannabis is deadly. I could, you know, shave the stalk into a spear and stab you through the heart with it. Um, and I'll leave that to speak as the authority and yield back the remainder of my time. Uh, just about every drug has a, has a lethal dose. We saw with alcohol here, unfortunately, at the beginning of the fall semester, young man uh, died of alcohol poisoning apparently in a fraternity house. Uh, these things are not uncommon in binge drinking. Uh, as far as, as lethal dose on, on marijuana, uh, again, I, I don't know that anybody, I, I'm sure that there are studies on this. Most of the people run into heart arrhythmias and other things uh, that, uh, that may result in death, but the problem with marijuana, psychoactive drugs, and alcohol is generally not poisoning, but basically impairment of uh, mental facilities, impairment of coordination that lead to uh, severe accidents and almost all the deaths in alcohol and, uh, and psychoactive drugs are related to severe trauma. Thank you. And Jake, do you have any follow-up? Um, the LD50 of, of cannabis, again, not an issue since it's not um, you know poisoning, but uh, just FYI, uh, estimated to be between one in twenty thousand or one in forty thousand uh, units. One in forty thousand. What does that mean? Uh, units, I believe. Well, how many? How many joints? Uh, <coughs> probably a metric uh, a crap ton. If you'll excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> so so sniffing, sniffing it off the roof of a car is not going to drop over dead. No. Okay. <laughs> All right, and we can move on to our next question. Oh, you get one more chance? No, I'm fine. Uh, I interacted, I think we interacted, and I hope that's okay. No, that's fine. And I just, if you, if, when you're asking the question, would you mind directing it you know, to me or to Jake? Because it, you know, we're going back and forth, and that way we don't have to think about, we can think about other things other than in my next. I'm that's trying to keep up with it too, so I can remind him. Yeah, that Go would ahead. be good. We can do that. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that way we don't get confused. I'm trying to think about other stuff. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, this question is addressed first to Dr. May. Um, are hallucinogenic properties of marijuana part of medical treatment? Not that I'm aware of in any, any regard. There may have been studies on this. There may be psychoactive uh, treatments going on. I'm not aware that marijuana has been uh, has been evaluated for use of treatment of mental illness, but it's very possible that it has. I'm, in fact, I'm almost certain somebody probably has. What we've seen, though, is a tendency for people to get problems such as psychosis, schizophrenic-like disorders, uh, uh, narcissistic-like disorders, and uh, and uh, so forth. Also, people become dependent because. Marijuana acts very differently than alcohol. Alcohol is a very short two-carbon uh, segment, which goes intracellularly, has benefits, uh, both the sedative uh, and excitatory components to the central nervous system, but also metabolized by the liver and other organs have, has a very positive response and probably some feedback. Whereas alcohol does not bind to the cell, marijuana goes to specific receptors on the surface of the cell and the binding coefficients, that is how long it stays on the cell, are unknown. We know that the effects of alcohol generally will wear off. If one can basically have one drink, which is equivalent to about 70 proof alcohol every hour, a normal 70 kilogram man will have the, the effects, uh, have, basically have no ill effects if he only drinks one drink per hour, theoretically. And uh, whereas smoking marijuana, the effects can linger on for several weeks. 
uh, marijuana can be measured in the uh, in the body for up to 30 days after somebody has smoked the joint because it's fat soluble, it's stored in the fat, whereas alcohol is immediately metabolized and, and clears the body. So that's how the two drugs, the two two compounds differ. Uh, uh, alcohol is totally metabolized, whereas marijuana may bind and may may stick to the cell and have long term and maybe even permanent effects. Did that answer your? Uh, it doesn't remain psychoactive, uh, you know, beyond the initial. Um, I don't ever recall hearing of a case where, you know, sort of like LSD, bad trips years later, uh, anything like that for, uh, for marijuana. So simply the presence of, you know, marijuana or THC specifically in the blood or in the, in the fat, you know, to be later metabolized, uh, uh, I don't think you're claiming that there's the remains or any psycho uh, psychoactive effect, or was I understanding that right? Uh, we don't know. We don't know. There's an effect there, but we do know that the ter law terms are, are long. The uh, the uh, uh, report that came out in uh, 2013 from uh, the uh, uh, Northwestern University showed that there are actually dem demonstrable uh, changes in the structure of the brain and in the function of the brain from heavy marijuana usage in, during the teenage years. So we do not have any idea how long this lasts. Uh, neurochemistry, surface neurochemistry is, is in extreme infancy. We know extremely little about how the brain functions, how things work. Uh, we, we know very, very little about how these drugs interact. We're only looking at this in a very, very superficial way, so we do not know the long-term consequences. And Jake, the remainder of Yes, I'm glad he mentioned the Northwestern study again. I'd noted it, I think, in his opening statement and had <coughs> neglected to return to it. Um, I and others much better than I have taken our, you know, turns at debunking the uh, Northwestern Structural Changes uh, article. Um, I'm happy to, you know, stick around uh, afterward and, you know, both of us just discuss that, not, you know, necessarily trying to change an audience opinion or anything. Um, and what was the rest of that question? <laughs> the use of the, are, are hallucinogenic properties of marijuana uh, part of medical That's treatment? right. And, and then, you know, they may possibly be, I guess, at some point in the future. You know, we don't know what we don't know yet. Um, but, you know, maybe with, um, uh, you know, psychological, um, uh, what, I can't remember what they're called, the, uh, uh, different types of therapies, um, uh, psychological therapies, uh, CBT, stuff like that, um, could possibly, but you know, there's no evidence I'm aware of either that it's been even used in that capacity. Okay. And I think we both, are, are you surprised on the time that you take on this question? Mm -hmm. Okay. No, we'll, move on we'll to complain. Next I think we're both vocal. Yes. We'll let you know. Great. <laughs> Fair enough. Question, I believe that Jake yes. So this is for you, Jake. Uh, do you think marijuana is a gateway drug? If so, how? Um, there's a lot of correlation, you know, that goes on here. Um, basically, persons who are willing to break the law currently to sell you marijuana are also more than willing to break the law to sell you many other products on their shelves. And by their shelves, I mean, you know, hey man, would you like to buy some illicit, you know, thing X, Y, Z? Um, you know, again, there's a lot of correlation. You know, people drink milk and later on go to use, you know, hard drugs or whatever. Um, uh, not saying they're causative. Uh, again, a lot of correlation. Uh, you go to Home Depot for some, you know, for a hammer and some nails. You just go for a hammer and some nails, but you stick around a little longer. You start looking around the shelves. You notice they also have lumber. You know, so a hammer and nails are you know have a gateway effect to other products that Home Depot sells. Uh, that's pretty much the gateway effect. And Dr. May, uh, looking at drugs, uh, uh, the situation is. Many people supposedly have used marijuana occasionally, have used it for short periods in their lifetime, have gotten away with this and have, have never gone back to other drugs. And uh, same thing with alcohol. Most people just use it socially, uh, normal part of a diet, uh, having a drink a day or whatever, and they never go on. The problem with getting high, though, from, from drugs or even from alcohol is that 
the more one gets high on a regular basis, the more product it takes to get high. And this is the problem with drug addiction, is that people will start at a low level, they get a high, this is great, they'll go on, and a day or two later, whoa, you know, I think I'll try that again. Well, they get their high and then they drop off. And as time goes on, they keep dropping off more and more and more, and there's an urge to consume much more of the product. Eventually, with marijuana users, uh, the high is not sufficient even when they're smoking several joints a day, and they may venture into other drugs. The most common drug that people venture into is snorting cocaine. That is the next, uh, next entrance drug beyond uh, the use of, of marijuana. Uh, this particularly high among criminals. 70% uh, of all criminals arrested now in the United States have uh, evidence of recent marijuana usage uh, at the time of arrest. And a follow-up? Which would also include the um, extremely high percentage of people arrested actually for marijuana, which is currently <laughs> illegal. Um, let's see. Um, I'm sorry. Can you... Uh, <laughs> Uh, is marijuana a gateway drug, and if so? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, there's something else I wanted to go to, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, you know, Dr. May has mentioned smoking marijuana a couple of times. Um, you know, that's not the only way to consume cannabis. Um, it's not, you know, the way... I don't recommend these, you know, things, uh, but... Uh, it's not the way, if I were a physician, that I would recommend to a patient. Um, uh, I'm actually a lifelong non-consumer of cannabis. And I say non-consumer because that's even a broader category than non-smoker. Any uh, follow-up? Yeah, most uh, people who are arrested uh, with marijuana, it's, uh, they're arrested for something else and the marijuana is incidental. And as I mentioned, these people often end up going to prison with a pled down sentence. They plead it down to simple drug possession or, or whatever, so they get, uh, the judge gives them a minimal sentence at the beginning with the hopes that these people are going to be uh, rehabilitated. Uh, eating marijuana has not been shown to be safe. There was a young African up in Colorado last year where they had, I believe it was some brownies, and he ate brownies, went absolutely berserk, and jumped over the hotel balcony, <coughs> fell four stories, and was killed. Was that the only thing in his talk screen? Uh, as far as I know. I don't no know. Alcohol or? I don't know. I don't know. That was all that was, that was, all that was reported in the, uh, in the uh, issue there. And again, many of the things that we're bringing up here, people, you and I can take a look at later. Right, right. Uh, the, people, the people here, everybody here I think probably knows how to do a Google or Yahoo search. So <laughs> again, we're planting information. And I hope, my hope with an audience is that people will go and look further into what is going on. And uh, as is often the case, uh, when you hear about you know, a school shooting or, or something like that, again, my background is firearm rights, you, know, you, you don't just take the Huffington Post article at face value. You try to read between the lines. Um, you know, uh, again, uh, our mutual friend, Kenny Kettner, um, you know, I, I talk with him a lot about this stuff, and uh, whenever, you know, the early report says so-and-so used an assault rifle, you know, and of course people just start off talking about that, assuming it as fact. Um, I have a, a challenge that I like to throw out, uh, a $200 bet. Um, I don't pull that number out of my posterior. That's the uh, price of a, of a tax stamp from the ATF to actually own one of those things. Um, no one's ever taken me up on that before because, again, I've been around this long enough. I know that the initial reports are often wrong, and then when we look at them after the, you know, the blare of the headlines, uh, the truth is often a little bit more nuanced than that. Alrighty, and uh, I think we have time for one more question before the break. This one is addressed to Mr. Seema first. <clears throat> what is the difference between synthetic marijuana and actual marijuana, natural marijuana, in terms of chemistry, and risk to the user. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, there is a lot of confusion between the two, uh, and I, it is my position that the term synthetic pot or synthetic marijuana is a misnomer and should not be used. Um, as with a lot of these problems, uh, with other, like uh, non-marijuana, just other drugs, 
uh, these are products of prohibition. Um, the uh, inventor, or if you can call him that, um, Huffman, uh, John W. Huffman, a research chemist at uh, Rutgers, I believe, uh, Clemson, sorry, um, he developed more than 400 different synthetic cannabinoids as an organic chemist at Clemson because he could not get uh, secure the, um, the FDA or NIDA, whatever the government, uh, he couldn't get the government stamp. So he said, well, I'm a chemist. I'll, um, I know basically what the structure is like. I'll create some. Um, I don't know how many of those 400 do or do not appear in nature. Um, but basically, uh, you know, this is a recent problem for us in the United States. Uh, the German government had this problem in the 90s. They went out, they, you know, they heard about synthetic marijuana or, or whatever they called it over there. And they did undercover buys at, you know, something like 400 places. Uh, and they actually subjected this to talk screens. Uh, what they found was that sometimes there were synthetic cannabinoids in this uh, product. And just as often, if not more, there were not. This is a black market. There are no truth in labeling laws. Um, basically what this is, it's just dried plant matter. It's not marijuana, it's not cannabis. Uh, it's any kind, of, uh, sometimes people, it goes by the street name potpourri, because that's basically what it is. It's dried plant matter, and then some uh, bathroom or bathtub chemist uh, comes up with some uh, liquid concoction which may or may not contain synthetic cannabinoids and may or may not uh, contain a lot of other uh, harmful substances. Uh, they hope they cut it in the right amounts so that you know it doesn't drive these people crazy and into the ER and they spray it onto this dried plant matter. And so the spray is actually the psychoactive uh, compound and it is Again, and unless these things have talk screens, you don't know what they are. Uh, I would be willing to bet if you go and score a sample of, you know, this stuff at some fly-by-night uh, store from some back alley distributor, um, there's about a 50-50 chance that there may or may not actually be a synthetic cannabinoid in it. Uh, the synthetic marijuana is something we've uh, done. Uh, I'm on my fourth term of the Lubbock Board of Health, and we dealt, started dealing with this about two years ago, and this was brought to our attention uh, <coughs> by uh, a person on our board who was involved as a psychologist, and many of his patients who are marijuana and other drug users were coming and saying, this is bad stuff, this is totally unlike any of the drugs we're taking, we should not be taking this stuff, this is really bad. Estimates that we were given at the Board of Health was an average of about three ER visits per day here in Lubbock. People in Lubbock apparently have died, have gotten in very, very serious problems. Uh, the, uh, where there may be some type of cannabinoids in here, what's happening, most of these compounds from what we understand are being made in China and North Korea and uh, are being synthesized to keep one step ahead of the law. As these compounds are, are uh, analyzed and cataloged, they are systematically banned by the states, including the state of Texas. But they keep creating new drugs, and the problem is, is that the states can't or won't give a blanket coverage to the class of drugs, where it'll cover hundreds of different drugs. So again, we have no idea what these are doing to the brain. We don't have any idea if they're binding. Many psychoactive drugs will bind permanently, or more or less permanently, to the, to the, to the body. These people are coming in with rapid heart rates, uh, cardiac failure, respiratory failure, uh, neurological problems, heart failure, kidney failure, liver failure. These are bad things, and I think most of the people, uh, people who will, I think Jake and I are probably 100% in agreement on this, as we are on a lot of things, such as guns and so forth. Um, <laughs> 100% that the synthetic marijuana, which has been sold routinely in our tobacco shops and other shops around Lubbock and elsewhere, should not be used. This is, the FDA has specifically not controlled this, uh, need, there needs to be more control on this. This is bad stuff and does not relate at all to the use of cannabis. Thank you for that. Um, <coughs> 
We're total, we're, you absolutely. Wanna, absolutely. Neither normal nor hub city normal uh, condone you know the the use of these um, alleged synthetic cannabinoids again because until they're tox screened you don't know what's in them. Um, we see this as another tragic uh, product of prohibition of, uh, of marijuana in the United States. Um, Dr. May mentioned, you know, staying one step ahead of the law. The law moves at the speed of government, not the speed of <laughs> commerce, and especially not illicit commerce. Um, uh, it, it, it's very bad, you know, uh, people are actually using this because they're staying one step ahead of the law. You know, there are these draconian penalties for marijuana use. And you know they, they see kind of an easy out in this stuff that uh, is still technically legal. It's it's tragic, and um, I absolutely agree with Dr. May on that. I have a little Dr. different May opinion. Uh, yeah. Marijuana is readily available. Anybody I think who wants to use marijuana here in Lubbock is not going to have a problem getting it, using it, and is not going to have a problem uh, uh, getting caught. But the people are using this because they want to experiment with something else, and uh, these things are are are. Uh, uh, not marketed. It says not for human consumption on the label. Uh, it's they say this isn't this is to put in a dish and smell, but it's sold with the purpose that people are going to smoke it or ingest it or use it otherwise. And people start you know chugging this stuff down, mixing it with soda pop, grape juice, whatever, and they get into very very big trouble. So again, I don't think it's because they can't get marijuana. I think marijuana is readily available. But if they want to use this because they want another type of high. It's just simply like in school, somebody comes along and says, hey, I got a bunch of pills here. You know, I want to have some of these, you know? A uh, lady just died last week with uh, unknown diet pill made in either North Korea or China. Uh, All right, and I think we're going to be going to break now. Did you both get your time for that question? I don't know if I got, did I? Go, go, go. I was just going to say, go, go, go. As long as it's okay with time. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I didn't claim that they weren't able to get this. Uh, there are costs, and one of the costs is the you know large prison sentences uh, that can be associated with this stuff. Uh, losing your family, CPS involvement, you know, uh, criminal and civil asset forfeiture that goes along with you know any quote unquote criminal activity. Um, so there are the law creates a perverse set of incentives to uh, to try these other things. Okay, and if we can take a quick break. All righty, we'll go ahead and start. And I believe that we left off with Jake answering the last question first, and so we'll start with Dr. May. All right. So, Dr. May, if marijuana were legalized, how would you judge the effectiveness of the alcohol regulatory regime applied to the regulation of marijuana sales? You're talking about sales or use? Yes. Yeah, so if it were legalized and it was sold just like it is in stores, the same regulations, the alcohol regulations that we have now, how would you judge, judge the effectiveness of that regime over marijuana sales? Well, what, what's happened in states where it's sold, California and uh, in Colorado and in countries where it's sold, uh, uh, particularly Holland, is that the they say that it's going to be legal so that the, country, uh, the state or the government's going to monitor it, but what's been the problem is that the crime syndicates that have been selling the illegal drugs move in and take over the market for the for the legal drugs. So that's one problem. The other is uh, is usage, is sales uh, to minors. That's a problem. Again, that's difficult to control because often a legal person of 21 years of age or over will buy it and and distribute it to other people, just like back when I was in high school, somebody who was, was 21 would go buy the case of beer and then distribute it to other people, uh, upon occasion myself included. Uh, but uh, uh, that is, uh, that is a, a problem. And then the other thing, of course, is intoxication. And this is the big thing. Uh, I'm very much an advocate of people who are caught driving under the influence, whether it be under the influence of alcohol or, or uh, drugs, uh, lose their license, uh, if possibly on two uh, two counts, they permanently lose their license. Uh, people who are involved in, in deadly accidents, uh, I think there should be mandatory long sentences uh, and under certain circumstances, mandatory uh, uh, capital punishment. And a rebuttal or follow-up? Or uh, it's your response. 
Yes, uh, so I have often said that there are already three existing models for marijuana law li liberalization to contrast slightly with your legalization question um, uh, for marijuana law liberalization in the United States. There's the tobacco model. You can buy it at the corner store, the grocery store, or specialty store, and it's mass produced by companies like Marlboro and Camel and regulated accordingly. There is the alcohol model, which kind of has two subtypes. Um, you can buy it at the corner or liquor store um, for you know, higher potency stuff. And it's mass produced by companies like Anheuser-Busch and InBev and regulated accordingly. Uh, or prescription drugs. You can buy it at the pharmacy and it's mass produced by companies like GlaxoSmithKline and Merck and regulated accordingly. Um, the, uh, the prescription model is probably the most stringent of the three. Um, you know, I'm not one to try to make the perfect the enemy of the good. Um, some people uh, in 1993 and 1995 in uh, trying to get the CHL law passed in Texas almost torpedoed it by trying to make the perfect the enemy of the good. Uh, thankfully, they did not prevail. And now, 20 years later, 10 legislative sessions later, uh, you know, our CHL law looks as good or better than they almost threw it under the bus for. Um, Let's see. Uh, so yeah, even though that's the most uh, restrictive of the three, I'd be happy to uh, start there. And I think that's an effective regulatory there, model. There's a problems with all regulatory models, particularly with the prescription drug, because a, l a large portion of the people who are dying from overdoses are prescription drugs, not illegal drugs. And people are getting prescription drugs, selling them, uh, using them inappropriately often getting them inappropriately. If one takes a look at the monthly report that comes out of the medical licensing bureaus in the state, and I get the ones from Illinois, California, and Illinois, where I'm licensed, and most of the crimes that are being committed, what people are losing licenses, getting their license restricted, and so forth, are people writing uh, prescriptions for others that they shouldn't be and often in large amounts. So uh, this is one of the problems where there is, is uh, uh, legal drug usage of marijuana, such as in California, often you see the doctor, and I'm not sure if they are doctors or not, maybe sitting there with sunglasses, shorts on, under an umbrella, writing prescriptions to people who go into the, uh, into the uh, marijuana dispensary uh, right next door. Um, one state uh, which chooses to regulate marijuana differently has a double prescription model. Um, you know, one doctor and then another separate doctor has to kind of double check that. Uh, would you be opposed to something like that to combat the problem you identified? I, I don't know. I have to have to look at that. We have to see how that how that worked out again. I mean, there's no perfect system. Jane. Exactly. There is, and with with uh, even with drugs that we're using right now, class. FDA class two, approved, FDA approved uh, narcotic drugs, diet drugs. One of the biggest problems we have right now are, are mail order pharmacies, who are people are buying from mail order pharmacies, and the federal government is slow to to, to get involved there. But you can buy virtually anything through the mail order. Like I mentioned, this one case of this college student last week ordering some kind of diet drug, and she dropped over dead. They still don't we still don't know what the drug was, but. There's lots of danger out there, and the problem we get into is we're going to run into mail order marijuana dispensaries where you call up, you talk with a physician. Uh, I've had offers to uh, to screen calls, to screen calls or to screen applications for drugs, particularly Viagra, and I could be paid three dollars per patient to screen. So you can imagine how much time somebody's going to put in looking at the medical record of the need if they're getting paid three dollars per patient to screen. People are going to be doing hundreds of these per hour. So they're just going to be checking them off. So there's there's significant dangers there, particularly when you're getting into mail order and other things. Right. So I think we I think we agree. I think we agree. the law can create a perverse set of incentives. <laughs> yeah, well, whenever possible. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And um, do we need any further discussion on that question? I think so. We're good. All right. We can move on to the next question. This is a question that's addressed first to uh, Dr. May. If made legal, what would you see the impact of marijuana on the American agricultural uh, segment of the economy? We're 
already seeing an impact. I, uh, I farm in Illinois, and there's several marijuana growing facilities going up in my area. And uh, marijuana is not legal in that area. Uh, it's just being grown, and it's going to be transported to other states, such as Colorado and California, and I believe Oregon, and possibly even overseas. So we already see an uh, upsurge in, in agriculture there. And particularly when we're getting $3.50 a bushel for our corn and less than $10 a bushel for our beans, which is less than our production cost, people are going to start diversifying. So uh, again, we're seeing an uptick there in, uh, in the growing. Of course, then we run into the problems of, of uh, how this is sold because people talk of selling it legally and getting tax ref uh, on this from the state. And someone says, well, we sell an ounce of marijuana, we charge $50. For the uh, for state tax, well, people aren't going to pay that if, they, if marijuana is fifty dollars uh, an ounce. And I don't have no idea what it is, or hundred dollars an ounce of the fifty dollar tax. People are going to be taking the marijuana off the farm or stealing it or whatever, and uh, and uh, and selling it at a lower price on the gray market. The other problem we run into is when we had a lot of cattle. One of the reasons cattle farming is not popular in my area is because we got rustlers coming in. They'll come in, get a fine, fat, thousand pounds deer and butcher them out and, and kind of carve them off uh, just like they would be uh, hunting deer. So people are, we we're going to have marijuana rustlers. We have sweet corn rustlers, people who come in and steal sweet corn. Uh, I have, uh, I have um, uh, walnut rustlers who come onto my farm where we have some very fine walnut trees with some very delicious nuts. And Jane and I will come to the farm and there's a big pile of walnut hulls where the walnut rustlers have stolen my walnuts. So uh, there's lots and lots of implications there and uh, uh, it's only left to the creativity of the rustler and, uh, and other folks. And then again, we're going to have people getting shot because uh, uh, farmers set up double barrel shotguns in their hen houses and so forth and uh, I'm sure that they're going to be protecting their marijuana fields. And in California, uh, for decades, Back when I was there in 79 onward, we'd always have people up on the Sierras getting shot uh, they, because they'd be up there hiking and they'd happen to stumble on a marijuana farm inadvertently. Did that cover? So one of the uh, easiest ways to uh, distinguish between the two is to you know, basically have marijuana indoors in a controlled grow facility and industrial hemp out in the fields. Um, in Canada, you know, I think they had two years where farmers said that, you know, the kids or whatever would come and, uh, you know, uh, back home, uh, cotton country, you know, similar to here. Um, one of our farmer friends would, you know, catch kids out in the um, cornfield, you know, stealing corn. Um, so in Canada, you know, kids would steal off of their industrial hemp. Uh, and it took a couple of years before all of the kids figured out that, there's nothing psychoactive about this at all. It's uh, no different, possibly worse, than smoking grapevine or banana peels or any of the other things I heard about as a kid. Um, uh, in addition to my earlier comment about the three regulatory models, I, I failed to mention that um, in late 2014 or early 2015, uh, the RAND Corporation uh, published a uh, study uh, for Vermont called A Dozen Ways. To, re uh, to legalize, uh, that's Vermont, uh, the marijuana supply chain in Vermont or any other state. Of course, there would be more than 12 ways if you're just trying to reform it and not go full on legalization. Right, and we can go on to the next question. And this should be addressed to Jake. Oh, okay. Would uh, legalizing marijuana in Texas have uh, an effect on activities uh, of drug cartels and on border security? Um, again, I, I'm, I'm here to talk about reform. Uh, yes, legalization is one type of reform, but that's kind of uh, swinging for the fences reform. Um, I'm more of a base hit kind of guy. Um, so yes, there's already evidence that you know uh, the cartels, like any other you know Fortune 500 corporation, are uh, modifying their strategies. Um, you know, uh, some of them are you know uh, they have generally lower quality uh, you know cannabis down there. Um, uh, you know, they're not uh, exporting as much over here, so they're you know ch trying to change their product mix. Um, you know, meth and other things. 
Uh, border security, as you folks know, I'm a big border security person. I think our border needs to be secure so we know what's coming across. Uh, and that would just solve a lot of our drug problems. But if we legalize it, the cartels, the uh, uh, crime syndicates, and so forth, are going to be very much involved with the legal trade and the, uh, the sale of it, just as they experienced in Holland, uh, just as we've experienced in other states here, is that there's going to be involvement of the, uh, the illegal folks. Uh, so uh, uh, that's going to be a problem no matter what happens. Uh, we have the same problem in, in, uh, in alcohol, alcohol production, alcohol distribution here. There's a significant involvement of crime families in uh, beer distribution, alcohol distribution. Uh, uh, people pay a lot of money, including protection money, to be able to distribute that if they're not involved with crime. So I think the same thing is going to happen with, uh, with, uh, with drugs, is we're going to have just another layer, and then there's always going to be the gray market, the illegal market of, of people selling, whether it be a better product or a lesser product at a lower price. I'm, I'm glad he brought up uh, bootlegging, essentially, uh, be it of alcohol, tobacco, or you know, firearms, or cannabis. Um, generally, uh, that's a market signal when you see um, busts, uh, you know, pounds seized, stuff like that, or just uh, bootlegging activity in general rise. Uh, sort of like that, uh, I think, congressional candidate in New York, the uh, rent is too damn high party. Um, there, that's a good market signal that the taxes are too high uh, when you see uh, the bootlegging go up. And uh, follow it? Fine. All right. We'll the time, and then we can go on with the next question. This will be addressed. That way we can move a little bit faster. That'll be just fine. We can get coverage here. <clears throat> Mallory, you ask, uh, address this first to Dr. Oh, Wood. Yes. yes. Do you think the section of the National Defense Authorization Act, uh, which allows for the authorized transfer of military hardware from the Department of Defense with preference to counter, uh, to counter drug requests, should be considered uh, in connection with uh, marijuana reform? Uh, meaning that we should have more militarization of our military? What is of our police? Is that is that the point? Because yes. in the National Defense Authorization Act, they have the military hardware from the Department right. of Defense being used for drug counter drug requests. So should this be reconsidered? Well, I think it needs to be looked at and looked at on a continuing basis because we've got two problems here. We've got increased in criminal activity in this country, and that's due to several factors. The biggest factor is is that we are are putting our criminals in jail and saying, well, they've served their debt to society. And we look at criminal law in the wrong way in this country. Putting people in jail should be getting them out of society. Not as a punishment, but getting them out of society and keeping them away from people in society. Uh, only in, in the last hundred years in the United States and other Western countries have we incarcerated violent criminals. Before that, they were all executed, so society didn't have to deal with them. Uh, the, the problem is, is that we're running into more and more violent criminals. Uh, the police are, are wanting more and more protection. They're more and more afraid. And it's a cycle where you get militarized and then the people use more and more militarization. We hear of people who uh, haven't paid their student loans, having militarized people from the Department of Education or other departments coming in and, and basically conducting a full uh, a full commando style raid on somebody who's behind supposedly in their student loans and in other situations. So uh, we've got a problem here with over militarization that needs to be looked at. We've got a problem with increasing crime. Uh, the, the, the two feed on each other and we have to be careful that we don't overreact. And uh, police departments on their own need to be careful that, uh, that they're not overreacting to situations using inappropriate force because if this continues to happen, we're going to have more incursion of the federal government saying we're going to control you. Did I cover that okay? Um, I'd like to first uh, you know, challenge Dr. May on the, uh, the crime side. Uh, you know, he mentioned crime in general, but uh, it sounds specifically like violent crime. Uh, the data actually show that violent crime is at a 40-year low. 
Uh, it was actually uh, one of one or more, I think one book chapter of uh, Freakonomics, if any of you have read that, when they were trying to look at the different reasons why. Uh, but to get back to the question you asked, um, I'm not a huge fan of you know Section 1033, um, I guess to put it mildly, but I, I understand it, you know, from where we are in this country uh, presently, like constitutionally. Um, it doesn't surprise me at all. Um, I would, however, you know, try to change it two different ways. Um, the first way, you know, repeal the NFA, the National Firearms Act of 1934, and by implication, most to all other gun control laws, GCA, FOPA, uh, 86, et cetera. That way, we the people um, can get, you know, some of the same things these police departments get. Uh, that's never going to happen. But uh, so, in that case, what about the uh, the second thing? If law enforcement agencies are going to participate in these programs and take these freebies, uh, I think they should be required to participate in FBI and UCR, Uniform Crime Report, and BJS, Bureau of Justice Statistics, data programs. Uh, currently, local PDs make up more than two-thirds of the 18,000-plus state and local law enforcement agencies in the U.S. That's BJS data. Um, 8,000 local law enforcement agencies participate in these reutilization programs. Um, however, only 750 of those 18,000 plus agencies reported data on use of deadly force uh, by law enforcement officers. Um, certainly not all 18,000 know, agencies had an incident of, of a deadly force, but uh, only 750 are reporting. Um, and then uh, in a DOJ study, use of force by police, overview of national and local data, about 150 agencies were expected to contribute data for the 1998 to 1999 data year. That's an extremely low percentage uh, of total and of the ones who participate in uh, these redistributive um, programs like uh, Section 1033. Maybe. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, go. One go. quote from uh, David Klinger, a uh, former police officer and currently criminologist with the uh, University of Missouri in St. Louis. Three sources of information about deaths uh, uh, by police, FBI numbers, CDC figures, and BJS statistics differ from one another widely in any given year or state. Um, actually, that's it. Uh, in any year or state. And. Uh, I I uh, just a brief comment. My concern still remains federalizing of police forces, making police forces uniform under federal control. And I am concerned that if we get, get legalization of marijuana or legalization of drugs, it's going to give the, the, the federal government another opportunity to federalize it and, and, uh, and basically uh, place under federal control of more and more of our police forces, sheriff's departments, and so forth. So that's one of the things I'm concerned about it, with legalization of, of drugs uh, as an excuse. Well, and they'll take any excuse necessary. And, and they're already doing that under prohibition uh, with these you know, joint task forces and stuff like that. So yep. Yep. Uh, we've already got that. Yep. All right. And are we ready to move on to the next question? Absolutely. Okay. All right, yeah, let's just, let's just do that. It's a quick follow-up. Uh, is the increased militarization or federalization of police forces nationwide related to the war on drugs? Uh, I believe that's mine first. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, um, I have a timeline somewhere. I don't think we have enough time uh, to access it, but I'm happy to afterward. Uh, but I mentioned earlier, you know, the, uh, uh, the former uh, iterations of uh, the DEA and uh, how their budgets and, you know, personnel have uh, grown. Uh, pretty much a direct correlation with war on drugs. Uh, and that's where a lot of the former um, revenuers or you know, uh, under alcohol prohibition ended up. In, f in fact, I mentioned their first uh, commissioner of the agency that is now the DEA, uh, Harry Anslinger, was a former prohibition agent. Uh, alcohol prohibition. In part it is, in part, it, uh, in my opinion, as a trauma surgeon, as we're seeing much more violent criminals uh, when I, I was seeing uh, eye injuries from a huge area here in this, this part of the United States that were brought in by uh, federal uh, and, uh, and uh, state police. And uh, most of these, more than half of them, about 60% of them were uh, uh, aliens, non-registered aliens, who were extremely violent. And it's been my impression that the, the violent 
level of criminals has gone up significantly. Uh, we saw this with, uh, with the mantra unit here. They quit using the ER at, uh, at the University Medical Center because nurses got raped and things went on. Uh, Usually a normal prisoner is brought in with two people. Very often we would see them brought in with five or six people, including one prisoner as I was examining him managed to get his chains around my neck and start choking me. So uh, uh, there's, 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 there's lots of bad people out there. And uh, uh, whether they come in with the drug trade or other things, I think a lot of them come up from Mexico or involved with the drug trade. And uh, the drug trade violence that we're seeing in the cartels of Me in uh, Mexico is among the most violent that we've seen any time, anywhere in history. Um, the uh, the gentleman who um, attempted to you know take his chains to you, you know, do you know what he was uh, in there for? Or under uh, the we didn't. Of? Uh, we didn't. We didn't ever discuss. What, uh, what personal things about the, okay. the patient or the, the case? But, uh, I'm uh, just curious because I'm, I, I'm no I'm no worse for wear. I'm, no, I'm no, a pretty no. big guy, and the guys who are with them uh, massaged him very rapidly. So uh, uh, I was just curious because uh, you know, like over the history of drug prohibition in this country, um, you know, there have been uh, uh, claims of superhuman strength. You know, for uh, uh, this guy had normal strength. He was just a big, big bad guy. Okay, okay. I didn't know if that's where you were going. No, 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 no. Okay. I, I had no idea, and I'm not making any allegations this was due to drugs. He could have been running weapons for Obama. Who knows what the situation was. <laughs> Good. All right. All right, are we ready to move on to the next question? All right, Dr. May, this is for you. Okay. Uh, in the land of the free, with the largest pr prison population in the world, over half of that in uh, federal prison is made up of non-violent drug offenders, according to government statistics. Uh, we find that marijuana violations account for about 28% of that makeup. Do you believe reforming mar marijuana violations would result in resources being freed up to combat more violent offenses? Not necessarily, and as I said before, the reason we have so much, uh, so much of the people that are listed for marijuana is because they've pled down from much more serious crimes down to marijuana, and they've gone in on on, on they've pled down and they've gone in on a much lower level. Uh, there are several reasons why we have uh, more criminals in our, our situation than other countries. Uh, one is the the fact that the, the, when a criminal enters a prison here in the United States, that their lifespan goes up considerably, uh, and. Uh, uh, this does not exist in other countries. The lifespan of a prisoner in a Japanese prison is four and a half years. And uh, that includes Canada is not much better. Uh, most people who enter prisons in other countries have a very short lifespan, do not do well, and uh, uh, don't go back because they don't want to go back to prison. Whereas here in the prisons, uh, even uh, though I certainly would not want to be in one, uh, they have lots and lots of things that are going on there and, and prisoners find them very often preferable uh, to being on the outside. Uh, the other thing is the recidivism. People go in there and they're put in a mixed population. Uh, one of the problems that we're getting into with prisoners now that, 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 that uh, is, uh, is a problem that's been going a long time is they're put in Muslim prisoners and other prisoners are mixed. Very often people become radicalized by dealing with, the, with Muslim prisoners or non-Muslim prisoners. It may, may not be religious, it may just simply be violent. So people are going in there and getting educated, coming out more violent, and they're released uh, when, they're, uh, when they're not, uh, they shouldn't be out in public. We just have to look on maps here in, in, in Lubbock. How many dozens of people here are sexual predators who are considered dangerous and have been released and back into society fully capable of carrying out bad stuff again? And, uh, um, so, yeah, uh, if, assuming arguendo that all those things are true, uh, it would seem to me like the answer would be to quit putting as many people into uh, these, this trade school for criminality uh, and or radicalization uh, for these, uh, and we may debate about this uh, characterization, victimless crimes. All right. And a follow-up? Yeah, again, as I said, these aren't victimless crimes. It's just pled down to the level of victimless crimes. And uh, you know, my own feeling is that violent criminals, repeat violent criminals, people who commit crimes with guns and knives, should not be kept in, in, in prison. They should be executed and eliminated as has been done in civilized societies throughout history. 
problem, biggest problem we have is thinking that we can uh, that we can fix something, okay, when it can't be fixed because 85% of these people are going to go out and cause problems again. And this is a difficult moral, religious, political, and social situation that I do not claim to have all the answers for. But I think we need to work for better answers in our prison system. And a follow-up? Um, I think up. that's the third uh, call for increased capital punishment or um, that, I've, that I've heard this debate. I'll give you a fourth one. Okay. Um, uh, uh, let's see. Um, actually, I, I'm going to pass on that. Okay. All right, and we'll move on to our next question. Uh, that's a good segue to the next question. Uh, addressed first to Mr. Seema. Should moral ethics be left out of this discussion since we're talking about public government policy? Um, I'm generally more of a, of a data person, uh, whether that's you know dollars and cents or um, you know academic studies or or whatever. Uh, you know, but far be it from me to you know kind of frame the debate, uh, frame some people out of the debate. Um, if people want to have you know moral discussions, um, I'm happy to. Um, just me personally, not speaking on behalf of any employer or organization, um, I don't find it especially moral, you know, to um, send the state to kick down people's doors, uh, stick guns in their faces, um, you know, by not practicing proper trigger discipline. You know, accidentally when startled, uh, you know, fire around into uh, someone who is allegedly innocent until uh, you know found guilty in a court of law by a jury of his or her peers. Um, to not throw a flashbang into a, a baby's crib, um, <coughs> you know, just all, all sorts of those things to separate families um, uh, and, and to put people in cages or execute them uh, for for these types of things. I personally. Uh, find a moral. Okay, and Dr. Mead? Uh, most of our laws are based on moral ethics. Our uh, laws, as, the, as our founding document, the Declaration of Independence, tells us come from God. And the purpose of our government is to protect those. And among those are the pursuit of life, liberty, uh, property, ownership, and the pursuit of happiness. The problem is, is that the drug trade uh, impinges on that because you have criminal activity associated with it. And then also you have problems with people who are on drugs who do violent things to their families, uh, to other property owners and such, and they impinge on the ability of people to enjoy their life, to enjoy their property, and to pursue their happiness. And that's where I have a problem with drugs. If someone were to go off and smoke whatever they want or shoot up whatever they want and have their full personal responsibility for themselves, their life, and so forth, and pay their bills, um, I'm the type of guy who say, hey, let the government let them go. You know, they're doing their thing. They're not harming anybody else. But the problem is that this spills over and other people are harmed. And that's where the, uh, where the government comes in and the government has to control this because other people are getting harmed by the activity of these people. It's not a big victimless crime. Much like in Prohibition 1.0, uh, prohibition of uh, the nation's relatively short experiment with uh, alcohol prohibition, um, you know, you have uh, people potentially doing, you know, uh, violent and or dangerous things because they're potentially hopped up on, um, you know, uncontrolled, unregulated, unknown chemicals in lots of cases, as, was, as is the case with the... Uh, synthetic cannabinoids, you know, that we discussed earlier. Um, you know, take this stuff out of the black market at the very least, you know, so we know and we have some data on the profile of these drugs. Um, cannabis, you know, percent THC, percent CBD, cannabidiol, percent other cannabinoids, uh, you know, the relative ratios of these things. Um, uh, very recently, uh, Molly's, you know, uh, uh, people aren't actually getting what they're paying for. Um, a lot of times these criminal organizations that uh, people want to empower sell something and then later on sell a substitute product that looks the same and people don't know the difference until they wind up in the ER. 
and a follow-up? Uh, one of the, the things that we're dealing with here with the original prohibition, as Jake mentioned, that was part of the, uh, the early feminist movement, the early progressive movement, where they, uh, uh, and rightfully so, women were saying, hey, you know, the guys go out here and they work and they get paid every two weeks, and what do they do? The first thing they get paid, they go to the tavern, they treat everybody else, they get totally drunk, and they come home and there's no milk for the baby and there's no food in the house. Big problem. So government says, oh, we'll, we'll fix that. We're the big... Big, uh, big uh, mama here, and uh, we'll keep uh, the guys from getting drunk and that, and they'll bring all the food home for the baby. And it uh, it didn't work out because people said, "Oh, you know, this alcohol, uh, we like this stuff, and uh, we want it back," and that included uh, most of the, the population. And uh, uh, continuing on there, it uh, it was it was it was well meant, but. Uh, it wasn't the problem of the alcohol, it was basically the problem of the work ethic of the people and the ability of people to handle themselves. And we still have the same problem with alcohol. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to the next question, and I believe this one will be directed towards uh, Dr. Dr. Again? Okay. I think that's okay. I don't mind. Okay, no, so this one is Jake. Now, who, did you take this last one first or did I? I'm pretty know. sure Jake. Uh, we're having so much fun here. We're not. Right? It's Jake's turn because you you ended with the follow up. So yeah. now, yeah. Um, so it went uh, Dr. May, Jake, okay. Dr. May, and then now it's going to be Jake, May, Jake. Dr. May, yes. Jake, okay. Dr. May, Jake. Yeah. So yeah. May, yeah. 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 Uh, so this is kind of actually, a, we'll expand a little bit on the the moral question. So where is there social or moral harm or good? And marijuana being legal or being uh, criminalized. Um, again, a point I you know hit earlier about you know not separating families. Um, you know, uh, especially terminal patients. I would hope Dr. May would you know would not oppose uh, you know, medical marijuana to ease symptoms, ease pain and suffering of especially people who are terminal. Um, you know, people worried still. Uh, you know about. Uh, using uh, marijuana as medicine, uh, not doing so uh, because they, you know, again, don't want their families to be separated, don't want uh, their property that they're hoping to leave to uh, uh, their survivors to be taken away uh, in our criminal justice system and uh, criminal and civil asset forfeiture. Um, you know, give people these choices between them and their doctors. As the Bible says, give strong drink to the dying man, okay? And uh, there's some dying man wants to have a joint or whatever. I mean, I don't particularly have a problem with that. The problem is, is the joint getting in the hand of the grandkids and the caretaker. Uh, uh, we have problems now. Uh, we've got uh, uh, hospices and such where uh, marijuana uh, or morphine is used in large amounts. You know, how much of that is getting out of there? How much of the strong drugs getting out of there? How much is getting out of the hospital? We have people stealing it. Crime is going to be pervasively with us. It's never going to go away. We're never going to get rid of the criminal situation. The question is comes down to still is balancing out. Is it a societal good to make drugs more available, or is it a societal good to restrict the drugs that are harmful to people? And I remain of the opinion that it's incumbent upon a society to protect people from the ravages of people who are on drugs, and that remains my concern in the legalization process, and particularly from what we have seen happen in Holland, particularly with the kids, and the fact that once it's legalized, it becomes a societal norm that it's okay to smoke marijuana because it is legal. It's okay to go out and get drunk with the big boys. It's okay to smoke cigarettes when you're 12 years old or whatever because it's legal. So in, in Holland, they saw a marked, marked increase in the marijuana usage, and the problem is the kids were smoking small joints outside the school, smoking before they went in, and they were totally useless when they got into the classes indoors. So it is not an easy problem to handle. And again, I, I, I'm a small government person. I want the government to leave me alone but I also want the government to protect me. Um, you, know, you mentioned availability, but under prohibition, uh, drugs are cheaper, 
stronger and more available. Uh, you mentioned about uh, drugs, uh, morphine, et cetera, getting into the hands of children. Um, I believe a minute ago. Not, not, not morphine, but uh, uh, I was talking about other things. Oh, okay, okay. Um, and earlier um, in our discussion, you know, about uh, people buying uh, beer and stuff for, for minors, um, you know, yes, that does happen now. But, you know, to what percentage is it actually a problem? Uh, I'm not saying, you know, uh, just like traffic fatalities, you know, the optimal number of traffic fatalities is probably not zero because in order to make things perfectly safe, uh, you know, we would cripple our commerce and everything. So I don't see anyone arguing for, you know, zero traffic or highway fatalities. Similarly, what is the, you know, appropriate amount of uh, people buying beer and liquor for minors, and the same for uh, cannabis, medical, or recreational. Uh, some of these problems will be uh, eliminated, of course, in the, in the near future when we have self-driving cars. So someone theoretically we could legally get in the car and be totally stoned, and totally wiped out on alcohol, push a button home, pass out, end up being in their garage. So again, I'm just tossing out some things. I'm not saying that alleviates the responsibility of society because someone who's stoned out of their mind can fall out of their self-moving car and uh, get into big, big trouble. So uh, tossing in just something for thought because I want people to think. But again, we have to protect. The job of the government is not to protect us from ourselves. I'll make that clear. If somebody wants to go out there and get stoned, drunk, whatever, they go off in their cabin and do it and take care of themselves and are not a burden to society or danger to society. I don't necessarily have a problem to it. It's where they are not productive, and particularly we're producing generations of kids who are not productive, are not the Einsteins, are not the Beethovens, are not the leaders. We look at the Democratic Party, there's no presidential candidate. I've got a, a surprise question. I think that, does that conclude our question? Okay. Oh, we're, we're going too fast here. <laughs> no, 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 we're, we're right on schedule here. Okay, this question is somewhat related to uh, your answers to the last question. Address the argument, it is my body, my decision, and it's healthcare implications for the individual and for the society. Uh, does that go to uh, let's start with Dr. May? Okay. The problem we have there, uh, Valerie, you bring up a really good question because again, I believe that that you know what I eat is my business. I want to go out and eat a two-pound ribeye. That's not my business. That's my business, and not uh, Mrs. Obama's. If I want to go have French fries, which I'm going to have in post very shortly, <laughs> that's my uh, that's my business because I think. You know, I'm going to take that oil, instead of putting it on a salad with oil and vinegar, I'm going to put that on french fries, okay, and I think that's okay for me. But the problem comes down to is that individuals are no longer responsible or can be responsible for their health care. Government has moved in and controls health care. Uh, insurance companies are no longer providing insurance, but they're, prepaid, they're, they're, they're selling prepaid health care. Real health insurance was where we paid our own expenses, we decided what we were going to buy, and if we had catastrophic problems and ended up in the hospital with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, of millions of dollars worth of, health, of, 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 of problems, that was what real health insurance was. So we've got now society is responsible, society is picking up the broken pieces, society has to pay for the uh, someone getting run over, a bicycle getting run over here, and somebody having their neck broken and being on a ventilator and a wheelchair the rest of their life. Society has to pay for that. The person who is using the drug is not held responsible even for their own health care. So if somebody becomes an alcoholic and ends up wiping out their liver, uh, society takes care of them. Someone uh, starts smoking grass and, and goes out and runs over somebody uh, or uh, ends up being non-productive in society, unable to get a job beyond uh, sweeping the streets or whatever, and there's nothing wrong with that, okay? I still go out and hold my bean fields. You know, my family never made, my dad made it through eighth, seventh grade, my mom made it through eighth grade. That's fine. They had low-level jobs all their life. They did fine. 
but again, to use drugs, use alcohol, use things that cut down one's productivity and one's ability to succeed is, is, a, uh, is a problem, a societal problem that damages society. So that's the way I, did I cover that properly? Okay. So I hope you're not suggesting like a, a Russian or Soviet Union style where we, you know, assign people jobs based on their highest productivity or... No, no, it's okay. free society. Okay. Totally free society. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, and I'm the, sorry. The, the question again was um, addressing the, the argument, it's my body, my decision, oh. and the healthcare implications for the individual and for the society. Parallels to the uh, you know CHL and campus carry debate, you know about um, you know my body, I'll carry in the manner you know that uh, that I choose and provide for my own you know self protection in the manner I choose. Um, but you know people are always worried about well what if what if and and you know what if someone did this when this was occurring and um, you know under a harvest moon um, you know we can what if situations to death. But what I've always asked is, you know, um, if you're not harming someone else, you know, you should be left alone. And if you actually are harming someone, that is an issue that can be dealt with. Um, actual harm, actual crimes. Um, generally, I um, am not a fan of uh, malum prohibitum crimes, um, more so of uh, you know, malum and say, the ones that uh, Dr. May was mentioning earlier. Uh, the types that exist at the founding of this nation, uh, actual harm. Th that can be dealt with when it happens. I'm fine. Okay. Um, and I have just a quick surprise question a that surprise we're going to end question. with um, before your concluding statements. And I just kind of wondered, and I had a couple of questions uh, from staffers in Austin uh, for representatives. I wondered if you had seen Representative David Simpson's op-ed in the Trib Talk, the Texas yes. Tribune, um, on the Christian case for draw, drug law reform. I wondered if y'all had read that. Um, you know, the case that says that you know if it was grown, God made it, then it's okay for us to use, and we don't need government to intervene there. I just wondered if you did hear about that, and if so, if you had any thoughts on it. Yeah, just to provide some background for okay. Dr. May, he's a Christian Tea Party Republican um, mm -hmm. out of uh, the DFW area, I think. Um, and he basically said, you know, um, God made it, it's there for us, so we should regulate it like tomatoes. <laughs> Any thoughts on that? You're first, I think, or am I first? Oh, I'm. Not sure. Well, and if you don't have any thoughts on that, I just wanted to I, I bring thought, attention I have, to I have, it. I have, I have thoughts. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just give you some background. Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, no, 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 I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. That, uh, that's a good question. Yeah. You first, me first. Uh, Mr. Simmons first. I'll, I'll take it. Uh, okay. Um, so, yes, um, neither Normal or MPP, the Marijuana Policy Project, um, um, we're going to put a legalization bill forward this year, and that's basically what Representative Simpsons is. Um, they kind of agreed before the legislative session uh, that there would be no legalization bill this year because it was um, you know, never gonna pass in Texas. It was Representative Neistat, um, I think I'm saying his name correctly. Uh, every legislative session, sometimes every other legislative session, he puts forward a legalization bill. I'm not even sure where he's out of, but um, um, I believe Normal approached him and asked him not to put one forward this year um, uh, because it was, again, swinging for the fences, making the perfect the enemy of the good. It was hurting Normal and MPP's um, uh, reform uh, uh, position. And uh, it kind of just came out of left field. Uh, and so everybody was kind of wholly unprepared for it uh, on both uh, sides of the political aisle this year. All right, and Dr. May? Uh, he brings up an interesting point, and God made everything as far as I'm concerned. Science is, is, is the evaluation of God's creation. Engineering and medicine are the applications thereof. And, uh, uh, but as Shakespeare said, he said, Nothing is bad or good. It's what we make of it that counts, Midsummer Night's Dream. Okay, so it's what we make of it that counts. 
Uh, there are throughout history, read Shakespeare, uh, read Plato, uh, read uh, 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 authors throughout history, there's poison. You know, those poisons are not necessarily bad because they, some of them are medicinal, but in large doses such as foxglove, uh, which is uh, 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 a heart drug, you give that in small quantities, it's great. People end up getting their dropsy taken care of, the fluid goes out of their leg, their heart starts pumping good and good, and good amounts, and you know, the prime example is digitalis. But uh, uh, digitalis is also a significant poison, as we saw with James Bond in Casino Royale, where they put digitalis in his drink, and the cute young lady came up with the drink, and he drank the digitalis, and his heart stopped and fortunately uh, got it started again because we wouldn't want to lose our expensive hero. But uh, again, you know, poison darts are used in South America. That's great for killing game, uh, for personal protection and so forth, but uh, you know, wipes out missionaries and other folks. So, and again, cyanide, you know, cyanide has beneficial, you know, certain things that are useful with that for dyes and industrial things. But, uh, uh, for the, uh, when I was in senior in college, the guy down the hall who broke up with his girlfriend and got drafted to go to Vietnam and took cyanide as an as a, uh, as a, uh, 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 easy way out, that was not a good thing. So again, it's, it's what we make of it, the same thing with, with, with drugs. You know, morphine, cocaine, uh, as an ophthalmologist we use massive amounts of cocaine in, in treating serious, serious eye problems. People would come into the clinic when I was a a resident fellow and, and uh, uh, what we call tertiary syphilis was rampant in the ghettos of Chicago and these young men had come in and young women and their eyes would be inflamed and swollen down and we'd give them an injection of a cocktail which contained cocaine around their, eye, their eyes and everything would you know expand and blow out. We used topical cocaine drops, uh, we used things for surgery, we used drugs uh, for surgery. These are absolutely great things but again abuse. It's like having salt. I'm going to put some salt in my french fries because I'm a bag of salt water. But there was a lady who killed her baby, her defective child. It was a young child and she was putting salt in his feeding tube and killed him by overdose. So again, nothing is bad or good. It's what we make of it and what we do with it that matters. Thank you very much. And uh, do you have a follow-up? I don't. Okay. Alrighty, and now we can go ahead and move on to our concluding statements. And uh, we drew, so Dr. May, you're going to go second, and Jake's going to go first. On okay, screen. that's fine. Good questions, guys. Thank you. That was really good, and really fun. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, so, students, oh, there. you can yeah, use the okay. podium or you can oh, sit. Sure. I agree. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, students for Concealed Carry, formerly Students for Concealed Carry on campus. Um, I was the faculty advisor for the Texas Tech chapter, uh, known as Tech Sons for Concealed Carry, T-E-C-H. <laughs> anyway, um, they have, a, we, you know, we encounter so many of the same arguments in that movement uh, that uh, at their concealedcampus.org website, they have a list of common arguments against campus carry. Um, one of the arguments goes, school shootings are very rare and college campuses are statistically very safe, therefore there's no reason or need to allow concealed carry on campus. And uh, SCC answers the charge, which I've excerpted here for brevity, uh, before going on to state, the statistics suggest that allowing concealed carry on campus won't hurt and might help, therefore there's no legitimate reason not to allow it. A free society does not deny people, uh, deny the people they write unless there is empirical evidence that granting that right will do more harm than good. We have both discussed uh, you know, empirical evidence up here today, uh, sometimes differing interpretations of the same empirical evidence. Um, we need to take that to its logical conclusion, and uh, you know, I'm sure I've cited studies that he would love to assail. I know he has cited studies that I would love to assail. Um, if we have time afterward, you know, let's sit around and maybe do this. I believe we have room until two, but as far as just the concluding statements, we can okay. go ahead and finish those. Um, I was glad to uh, learn that Dr. May was not a fan of uh, some progressive era legislation. Um, it is very hard to ignore uh, the racist roots of gun control, of, you know, the labor union movement, and of marijuana prohibition in this country. Um, 
they all have very similar backstories and from about the same period um, in time. And uh, the same person was president during a lot of uh, during a lot of that time. Um, in fact, uh, uh, I know you're you're an FACS uh, fellow, but uh, are you also a member of the AMA? Or I'm not sure. I uh, I resigned my membership of the AMA, and I got a standing ovation of 500 people at a gathering of the. Uh, the Heritage Foundation. Oh, okay. I was the only speaker that day to get that, but I, I, the AMA and other medical organizations are not friends of ours. Okay, I was wondering. I didn't mean to interrupt, but no, I think, no, no, but no. We're just uh, talking back and forth. But they, they opposed the uh, passage of the Marijuana Tax Stamp Act in 1937. Um, let's see. Uh, and then their legislative coordinator specifically opposed it uh, because he very much doubted all of the, uh, you know, the laundry list of. Um, Criminality and um, and you know just all all around bad things that you know, people claimed would happen from that. Um, how much time do I have? Oh, okay, I'm fine. I'm fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. Perfect. Yeah, uh, we're all right. We got a few minutes. You know, go ahead. Go ahead. several times uh, today, both before and during the debate, uh, you know, I've, I've heard you know Dr. May mention things about you know people getting high. Um, Ultimately, H.L. Uh, Mencken uh, in 1949 defined Puritanism as the haunting fear that someone somewhere may be happy. Um, I, I, like to, I like to edit that slightly um, and, and say the haunting fear that someone somewhere may be having fun. I mean, oh, the horror. Um, <laughs> I don't necessarily know that that is cause for our federal government uh, to step in and um, you know ban something. Um, we mentioned earlier the legal or legislative history. I'm having trouble rifling through my notes right now, but um, uh, Wickard v. Filburn, Supreme Court case from 1949 about a farmer uh, trying to grow in excess of, I think, the other NRA, the National Recovery Act allowance. Wheat, wheat. Yeah. Uh, yes, his, uh, his governmental uh, allowance of, of pittance or whatever, of wheat for uh, commercial use. Uh, he grew over that, but not for commercial use, not for interstate commercial use. Indeed, not even for intrastate commercial use. Uh, he grew it for personal use, personal consumption. Uh, that's also a phrase we occasionally hear in the uh, cannabis debate, uh, personal use. Um, that case was uh, the precedent for uh, Gonzalez v. Reich, often known as the California medical marijuana case, uh, in which um, uh, marijuana grown for medicinal purposes. Um, I actually know Angel Reich, one of the respondents in that case, uh, not well, but in passing. Um, you know, she just had a seizure or whatever the other day that left her face malformed for about four or five days. Uh, we can talk about her actual diagnosis later. I can't remember what it is. Uh, but anyway, she was one of the respondents uh, in, in that case. And uh, that's an interesting case because, you know, most Supreme Court cases in recent memory are, you know, 5-4 this way or the other. Uh, you know, you've got your four quote-unquote liberal justices and your four quote-unquote conservative justices, and you've usually got a swing vote. Uh, so that's you know where the five uh, ends up instead of four to four. Uh, this case, you, uh, they, ac they actually the five four majority with the swing vote was able to peel off Scalia. So he joined the liberal wing of the Supreme Court in voting uh, to uphold um, uh, the ban, the federal ban uh, implicating the CSA of 1970. Um, and that left uh, O'Connor, Rehnquist, and my favorite Supreme Court Justice, uh, Clarence Thomas. Uh, he's a distant first, uh, but he is my favorite. It's, it's a low bar uh, on the court. Um, and so but, you know, the majority was able to peel off Scalia uh, because basically the legal argument was uh, much like in uh, Wickard v. Filburn. You know, um, even though this stuff may never move in interstate commerce, you know, the federal government has uh, an a vested interest in not having its power diminished, essentially, uh, and regulating even non-economic activity. Uh, Clarence Thomas uh, made, a, made a mockery in his dissent, uh, and a well-deserved one, of the majority's, uh, uh, not finding it here, uh, 
you know, the, the government could, you know, by using the majorities, including Scalia's uh, opinion, that the government could uh, regulate quilting bees and potluck dinners and, and all sorts of non-economic activity. Um, you know, is that really the place that we've come to in this country in order to save or salvage, uh, you know, marijuana prohibition? Uh, every once in a while, a state will come up with a, uh, uh, what's called a federal uh, firearms freedom act, you know, to take back from the federal government its regulation of firearms uh, on, on much the same grounds of, you know, Gonzales v. Raich. Um, I don't know if that's the right, it's a question. I don't know if that's the right place we should be at in this country, and I leave that to all of you. Ready, and Dr. May? Uh, uh, Jake, I've enjoyed talking with you, and, and uh, this has been absolutely great. You're a very rational, uh, straightforward young man, and we agree on a lot of issues. Uh, we don't agree on the legalization of marijuana, but I think that's good because we get out here and talk about it. You talked about H.L. Melkin, who uh, was the editor of the Baltimore Sun Sorry. for many decades. Uh, just absolutely great man. My favorite quote, of course, is he said, when the country falls apart, it's going to be the fault of the news media because they're portraying it in, uh, what, what happens uh, improperly. And I think probably you and I both agree on that. Uh, that said, I still think there are significant problems with the legalization of marijuana and other drugs that uh, uh, mandate that we in Texas should not be legalizing it. Uh, we should be uh, sitting back and watching what's going on. The Dutch have found that the legalization of uh, marijuana has been disastrous. I think Texans and I think other states, I think our federal government needs to look at what happened over in Holland. I think it is a study that has already been done. It's still a study in progress and people need to look to see what, the, what has happened over there in Holland. Yeah, from a dispassionate point of view, both people like who believe as you do and people who believe as I do should look at that because they've been through that. Colorado is going through it. California is going through it. Former head of the DEA says it's a disaster what's going on in those states. Again, I am up in Colorado at the airport and people aren't stoned in the airport or selling grass or anything like that. And there's no marijuana candy because we've checked out that they're not selling marijuana candy in the airport yet. But uh, uh, who knows what's going to happen. I think the problem there is interstate commerce uh, they're, that they're running into is why they're not selling it at, at, the, uh, at the airport. Uh, legalization reduces the social stigma of marijuana usage, uh, highest, and that's resulted in Holland again, highest use of marijuana use in children, preteens, teenagers, and Amsterdam became the most violent city in Europe. And this needs to be looked at. Why did this happen? Was it because of marijuana? Was it due to other factors? Is it related? And again, this is really a good thing that needs to be studied. Uh, states banning uh, banned tobacco in places. Uh, I've been involved, as you folks know, with, uh, with the tobacco situation. I'm not an advocate of tobacco smoking, but I believe that if somebody has a bar or a, or a, a building and they want to have, have food there or alcohol and they want smoking, that's their business. The city and the state should not be interfering in that. Uh, yes, tobacco causes problems. That's not without problems. I, I, I'm not an advocate. But again, I'm not an advocate of marijuana smoking. Uh, EPA environmentalists, they're not complaining about uh, uh, smoking marijuana, but they do complain about cigarettes. They complain about secondhand smoke. They complain about cigarettes producing carbon dioxide. Well, in California, it's predicted they're going to have about one to two billion joints a year smoked by the population, and that's going to increase pollution, but nobody's saying anything about the effects of secondhand smoke on, on people, on kids, on people, wherever they may be smoking. Uh, question comes up, what are the medical and social costs to the people of California? Uh, and these all need to be looked at. Uh, both alcohol and marijuana cause, cause dulling effects of the brain, the sensorium, abilities for coordination. Alcohol generally lasts only a few hours. Marijuana can last weeks. Uh, marijuana causes weight gain. We've got a problem with weight in this country, but we don't hear Michelle Obama saying, kids, don't smoke marijuana, it'll get you fat. <laughs> Instead, she serves some things in school that the kids won't eat, hoping that if they get non-palatable food that they'll somehow lose weight. Uh, scientific research, we talked about this, continues. I think it's extremely important. 
We need to look at the damages of brain development. We need to look at the mental. We need to look at the physical functions. These need to be looked at seriously. Uh, memory loss, psychiatric problems, leukemia, cancer, immune system disorders, heart and blood vessel disease, birth defects, uh, decline in the tension of personal hygiene. All of these things are, are factors that are related with marijuana smoking and uh, from individual to individual. Uh, the de decriminalization of marijuana in Holland, uh, Colorado, California uh, has increased violence, crimes, family difficulties, poverty, social disintegration, and we've got a huge problem in this country with family breakdown. Uh, monetary costs, social, medical problems created by marijuana decriminalizations appear to significantly outweigh any economic benefit from the state. They say, well, we're going to get $50 an ounce on taxes. Well, the problem is that people say, we're not going to pay that $50. We're going to sell, you know, hey, kid, you want to buy a lid of marijuana? You know, it's 50 bucks. You go in the store there and buy it, it's 100. Uh, primary neurochemical effect of marijuana, as described by psychiatrists and psychologists, is it takes away ambition takes away drive, takes away achievement, takes away the person's ability to pursue and achieve the American dream. As I said before, marijuana usage is not characteristic of high achievers, of high academic people. Uh, you don't see kids at the National Spelling, spelling Bee rolling joints outside. Uh, that is not a characteristic of high academic achievement. Uh, it creates academic and economic losers, robs our nation of productive and responsible citizens and new generations of leaders. And this is what I fear is because we are having a problem with leaders right now. We do not have enough leaders. We do not have people pursuing the American dream. Barack Obama may be demonizing the American dream, but the American dream potential is still there and it needs to be reignited and we do not that want that suppressed. We don't want the next Beethovens and Einsteins and, and such not uh, reaching their potential because of drug usage. Holder and Obama have not uh, uh, enforced federal law prohibiting legalization of marijuana. Repeatedly, President Obama has been in violation of Article 2, Section 3 of our Constitution, which says the President should take care that the laws are faithfully executed. He's, again, here selectively not enforcing the law. I have a problem with that. If the law is not good, he should go to Congress and say the law needs to be changed. Change the law, give it to me, and I will sign it. So again, let's not circumvent the law. No matter what we agree on or disagree on, let's have fix the laws. Uh, if Colorado had to pay the full bill for the unemployment, health care, welfare of the people, the people of Colorado would not have legalized marijuana. A lot of this falls on the federal government. Uh, until we get unemployment, health care, and welfare back to the states, and I fully believe that that education, welfare, and health care should be under the control of the states, not the federal government, until we get it back to the states, the communities, Lubbock County, the city of Lubbock, the people don't understand the, the impact because it's spread over a huge area. The federal government prints money, borrows money, and uh, we don't see the cost of it. It's just like when they uh, take out every month or every week, they take money out of people's paychecks for their taxes and withholding. People don't pay any attention to that. Um, legalizing marijuana and appears to increase drug problems, violence, assaults, murders, other crimes uh, in states where it's legalized. And I think we Texans don't want these problems. We should not want marijuana mover, users moving to Texas. Uh, and we shouldn't have marijuana tourists coming to Texas. After that, I, I am done. I've enjoyed this. This is absolutely great. It's been, it's, and you've been one of the finest folks I've debated with. You've been a nice guy, and I've enjoyed it. <laughs> the questions have been superb. Amanda, you did an absolutely great job. I think we need applause for the questioners. Thank you all for coming. I definitely like to thank Ron Wheeler. Uh, he used to be a leader of Love of Liberty. Originally, back when it was a little bit different, we didn't have these workshops going on or these uh, uh, you know, the speaker series that we have going on. And so I'd like to thank him for being out here. Uh, Mallory Miller, supporter of all of our events since we've started. Thank you so much for agreeing to be in this position. And um, I think it was very effective that you both were here. It was just perfect. And thank you so much, Dr. May, for being a speaker here and debating and being willing to put yourself out there to have this discussion on marijuana. And thank you, Jay, for all you're doing and your activism um, for the subject as well. I appreciate you both. 
And I'd like to thank you all for coming out as well. I'd like to thank the Mayhon Library. Always public library is just wonderful. I would suggest that you use this facility for events in the future. Um, I've always felt like it works very well for all of our events, any type that we have. And so I'd like to again invite you to go to lubbockliberty.com to view any other previous events that we have done and um, check those out because there's some great events and people will be watching this from year for years to come all over the world we have viewers so please encourage people to go and watch these videos and um, I would also like to just kind of end with saying that um, we've got a lot of bad things lots of things that will well I guess it's not good or bad but lots of things that we can hurt ourselves with depending on how we use it and we have to ask the question do we want the government involved in those things or do we not? Are there certain things that we'd like the government involved in to protect us and to protect other people from hurting other people? Um, or do we want to leave that to the free market system uh, to decide that and people's responsibility? So leaving with that, thank you all for coming. And thank you for doing the timekeeping. I thought that was excellent. Thank you so much. Yes, absolutely. Our video out there, very good. Thank you. We have the room until 2, and so um, we'll kind of get things wrapped up. And thank you all for staying a little bit later. It's important to get that information discussed. If somebody had to leave that you know, then just let them know. It'll be available on loveofliberty.com. Yeah, <laughs> 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 <laughs>